GW Perth and SAS Adelaide proudly present In Euclid Tonight with your host, Stuart Wagstaff. Good evening from the Travellers Village, right here on the border between South Australia and Western Australia. I don't know what it's like where you are, but here it's absolutely freezing. I thought the desert would be warm and dry, it's been pouring the rain, and I've never been so cold in my life. They've got me here dressed up like a second-rate head waiter, and this ridiculous instrument, which I'm supposed to play... All I can get out of is a sort of an apologetic burp. I really think I've had enough of standing out here. Sandy is there from the early bird show at TVW. Isn't it freezing? Oh, I can't believe it. Have you been inside recently? In there? No, I think it's warm. Well, I can hear a lot of music and noise from there, and I think that's the only place to be. This is ridiculous. Ready? Yes. Let's go. go. We'll see you in there. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Well, I met my little Okay, my ladies and dog. gentlemen, hold it, Chris. Hang on, ladies and gentlemen. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Stuart Wagstaff and Sandy Baker! Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> my God, it's better in here. It's, it's... Good evening. It's warmer in here. Out there, it was freezing cold. We have to rush in. Thanks for the use of your comb. We're, oh, we're well groomed now. Good evening. I knew we were going to have trouble with those truckies at the back. You know what I'm going to do if I have trouble with those truckies? I'm going to turn the camera on them. I'm going to turn the camera on them and tell their bosses how long they've been staying here. Which, <laughs> but I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't do a thing like that. Let me tell you first that this is probably the most distant outside broadcast in history. We're going to apply to the Guinness Book of Records to find out if indeed that's true. We're what? We're just under 15,000 kilometres, 1,500 kilometres from Perth and just over 1,300 from Adelaide. So we're pretty remote, aren't we? About the longest television link-up on Earth, ever been done on Earth before, Stuart? We will get on the Guinness Book of Records if it kills us. And I must tell you, the two guys from the, uh, what's it called, Telecom Australia, Colin and Stuart, they've been terrific. They've made it possible for us to link up to Perth and Adelaide. And what about this place here? Fantastic. I thought it was a little oasis where 20 people had come. Look at them. They're here from all over, well, Bustleton, Albany there, right? All I think. Australia, I think Victoria. And Victoria. All, all over the country we've got people here. And most... Uh, what about Tasmania? <laughs> oh, I see. That's where you're from. Never mind. Someone's got... <laughs> Welcome to the mainland. Anyway, it's great to see everybody here, and what a, this is a super place. I expected a little shed out in the back of beyond, well, we're in the back of beyond, but this is anything but a shed. This is the, the Traveller's Village, BP Traveller's Village, and it's great. Aren't they looking oh, after as well? The accommodation we've had has been simply fabulous, hasn't it, Stuart? And the girls in the kitchen are working their feet off. <laughs> 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 they really are. This morning, you had to get up to do the early bird show, and the Adelaide people had to get up even earlier because of the time difference, and they had breakfast on the table at 4.30 this morning. I was still in bed. So, that is, that's it. And look, oh! Oh! And this is, this is just one course of the sort of thing they give us. It's absolutely beautiful. What's your name, love? Betty Moore. Betty, and you do all the cooking out there? Breakfast. Just breakfast? <laughs> well, it's, it's beautiful. What is that? What sort of fish is that? I don't know. Hello. Who, who are you? Richard. Richard. Yeah. Are you a chef? No, just a cook. What's the difference? Same dip. <laughs> <laughs> well, you both do a mighty job. Thank you very much indeed. That's tremendous. Thank I tell you what, why don't you leave this here, Betty? And then while we tuck into this, I want you people at home, and we'll watch it here, to have a look at a piece of film, a film special we made about the air highway. Now, I'll cross over to you now, and I think I'm getting signals. I think we're about ready to show you that film. We are. So off we go. You have a look at the documentary about the air highway coming up now.
very good fire across there. How's yeah, the new road going to affect you? Oh, no more bull dust. You and I know how we've cursed it. The heat and the flies and the mud. When you've run out of rubber and sat patching tubes and sweating tears of blood. Add to this truck driver's lament, the frustration and hard luck story is of the adventurers who've tackled Australia's highway horror strip, the air. Dust, mud, floods and potholes have combined to turn the dream into a nightmarish experience for those who've dared challenge the previously unsealed 500 kilometres in South Australia to the WA border. But there are those who have conquered it. Pioneers like Aubrey and Gwyn Melrose. It was a camel pad, really, between the telegraph lines. You know, the poles went up. And as they put up each pole, the camels used to go through them. And uh, that's the track that we went through. Were you ever frightened that you might be lost? No. No, the, in those days, the overland people or the station people were very nice. And they only saw a car about once a week. And uh, they offered hospitality and we d took things in return. What did you think when this man, your, your husband, first asked you to go across the Nullarbor Plain with him? What did you think of him? I thought he was crazy. <laughs> He's always been crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the other is he trying to stop us. He yes. tried to stop you? Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you react to that? I said, no, I'm going to be all going. And you pressed ahead. Hmm. Oh, we had a lot of fun. At um, Balladonia. Balladonia, we couldn't see any uh, road or land for about a quarter of a mile. It was just a, a whole hmm. sea of, of uh, water. So they all knew there was a, a dam nearby. Hmm. And he thought he saw the gate, and he was going along to the gate. But he got to the dam or somewhere, and he was up to his waist in water. And how did you get through it? Well, then he found the bit of road, you know, found the firm road, and he uh, opened the gate. I sat in the car, I didn't get wet. <laughs> How many of these gates did you open in a day? Oh, that, d during that five mm. days, I think it was... Uh, six oh, no, 65, I think it was. For 45 years, it was Aubrey Melrose's pipe dream that a sealed road should join East and West Australia. It was a dream nurtured from the time he created history on a continent-crossing motorcycle ride in 1931. Every type of bad road imaginable was the description given to the highway by writer Hedley Burge in the West Australian newspaper in April 1957. By then, a trickle of vehicles tracked across every day. The journey is still regarded as a hazardous adventure. Governments had an obligation to change this. The shovel, used by WA's longest-serving Premier, Sir David Brand, is displayed to remind others that the West completed its section seven years ago. Following a route north of Edward John Eyre's 1841 expedition, the original highway ran inland for most of its 2,700 kilometres between Perth and Adelaide. Its cratered, dusty South Australian stretches drove deep into the almost waterless Nullarbor, with relief for motorists only at a handful of remote station homesteads. The tourist yearn for sightseeing was almost entirely disregarded. The endless plain was their monotonous misfortune. With its commitment completed, the West Australian government called for an equivalent contribution on the other side of the border. Sir David Brand pointed across towards the border at Western Australia's opening ceremony at the 500 kilometre section he called No Man's Land and demanded action. Three years later, the South Australian Highways Department reluctantly started a seal from Seduna. After all, there was no value in helping tourists through its state to Western Australia, and the federal government retained its tight-fisted attitude to the highway. Balladonia is as old as the plain itself, and the crumbling, disused telegraph station, one of the last relics in the communication lifeline which once spanned the continent. Vandals, the modern-day scourge of the plain, are hastening the end. The warning signs keep most people away, but the telegraph line is now impotent and the building's future clouded. There was a time when bustling Balladonia homestead welcomed journey-weary travellers. 
when the Crocker family could employ enough staff to entertain the inquisitive visitors. There was a unique history here, a giant wombat bigger than a rhinoceros that roamed the plains a hundred million years ago, the Nullarbor explorers, the ghosts of the gold rush days. Owner, 73 years old, Mrs. Amy Crocker, showed them the heir's history committed to canvas, but tragically still won't allow outsiders to record it for the inquisitive world. Nature is winning the battle at Baladonia. Perhaps Mrs. Crocker's son John and his family will have no choice. They might hop on the tourist bandwagon, restore and reopen the historic old buildings. A hundred camels came down this hill above Baladonia one day in 1894 and signaled the start of a transcontinental service to the east, which was to last over 50 years. The camel trains were slow but reliable. Hundreds of cars weren't, and Old Majira Station, 196 kilometres west of the border, at the start of the picturesque row plain, doubled as a casualty clearing station. The hazardous, spectacular Majira Pass descent was forgotten by the motorised pioneers as they drank and dined in the bars of the air's oldest tavern. <laughs> Rabbit trapper Jack Smith started today's transformation when he set up a freezing plant at the old place in 1956. In its 98th year, the man-made oasis which saved and nursed thousands of self-styled pioneers is in its death throes, falling to nature vandals and trophy collectors. Desalinated water, supposedly modern man's invention, flowed from this unit at Madura 76 years ago to quench the thirsts of Brumby horses trained for the British Army in India. Eras apart, old Madura and today's three-quarter million dollar hotel motel complex at Baladonia, first stop on the plain from the west. A plushness that would do justice to any major city complex hugs the journey-weary 1976 traveller. He wants for nothing, and newly won competition along the air will keep it that way. Baladonia today bears little resemblance to the ten-room complex which catered for the trickle of tourist traffic over the past two decades. Oh no, Pat Prendival has staked his financial future in this desert Taj Mahal. The next few months are crucial to its success. His financiers expect him to back up giddy growth predictions with repayments. Pat Prenderville became hooked on the Nullarbor 11 years ago. He put up over $100,000 to buy and renovate the old Baladonia Motel. And now, backed by predictions of massive new road traffic increases, has another $580,000 riding at Cockle Biddy, 240 kilometres to the east. Only low walls of brick, mortar and timber frames today. These are the empires of tomorrow's motel magnates. Superlatives don't do credit to the transformation at Madura. The past descent is a breath of head-lightening air after the boredom of the plain. Nature can't take all the credit for the changes at Madura. The biggest project on Australia's longest motel strip is also taking place there with $900,000 being poured in by joint venturers, Highway Motels and the Shell Company. The biggest today, but who knows about the future? One thing certain, pioneers like Jack and Mary Smith, who made it all possible, are now part of another era. Their crude battle to provide city comforts on the hostile Nullarbor have been replaced by space-age plants like a desalination unit which converts the salty Nullarbor water into a mixture purer than capital city's main supplies. Some relics of the past do remain, converted for temporary use by the locals. Others, tourist guides for over a decade, are outdated in the metric era. Their days numbered in the path of progress. Nullarbor, an oasis in a sea of desert scrub 190 kilometres inside South Australia, 
is in the throes of upheaval, joining the chase for the new tourist dollar. Reprieved because of its isolation, because it's still needed to fill the tanks and gullets of the thirsty tourists, Nullarbor will survive the bitumen revolution. From the WA border, the race is on in earnest. People who saw the potential of a sealed highway are starting to count the mounting returns. 81 kilometres to the west, at Mundrabilla, the sheer remoteness of the place is forgotten. Out in the wilderness, there's coastal resort recreation. Golf, tennis and swimming are part of the package offered to intending guests. The Pioneer Cattle and Sheep Station has entered the short stop quick service age and sealing of the bitumen means the first returns for five years effort put in by proprietor Roger Langford and his wife Pat. We spent four and a half to five years here now working pretty well day and night you might say. It was our long hours and all hours. But, uh, so far everything we've made out of the place has gone back into it for everybody's benefit, tourists, staff and so forth. But once the, the people get used to the idea of the road sealed and uh, all start moving, which we expect to be a great increase, uh, we'll benefit financially, as the same as every other place along the highway. In one way, uh, it'll be very accident prone, not because there's anything wrong with the road, it's a perfect road, particularly the South Australian side, and once our side's widened a foot each side as they intend to do, or two foot each side, it'll be uh, one of the best highways throughout Australia and the longest. Also, it'll be wide open to a lot of the uh, rougher type element from both states, both sides of the states, going backwards and forwards, which I think the highway can do without, and each state can do without. Hardly noticed by today's rush trip tourists, the old gravel highway forks away from the new blacktop at the border. Its destiny and those of the handful of people tied to the red ribbon of dust are doubtful. Kunalda, carved out on a three-quarter million acre leasehold 38 years ago, is one of the casualties of the rerouted highway. The road which once passed its door, bringing up to 40 cars a day, has been moved 14 kilometres away to cater for the sightseers. Kunalda has been pushed out of the mainstream of the motorised age into a dark and dusty future which it will be battling to survive. The new road, those 14 kilometres and a world away, has cut off the bread and butter income which station owners Cyril and Audrey Gurney earn from a service station they've run on a 24-hour-a-day basis for the past 35 years. Their licence has been taken away and Cyril can't afford to set up new premises down the track. The day the new road was opened, we didn't get one car, not a car. Cyril, your friends all probably still pop in, won't they? Yes, yeah, they will. That's just when you know we'll come in. So you never know whether they're there. 14 kilometres off the road or 40. They'll still come and see us. Our mail will be left on the road three times a week by pioneer bus, and we have to go down and pick it up 14 kilometres, whereas before <laughs> it was dropped at our door. <coughs> So for you, things are going to go backwards instead of forward? Yes, it'll be back to where we started off, just about. And just on the sheep. Mm. What's going to happen Stay. to you? What's going to happen to your petrol station? Oh, there's no more, there's no more petrol station. You have a license? Yes, we'll just cancel the license at the end of the month. They're taking it away from you? Oh, just can't, no, cancel our license. Well, I'll took it just for my own use. So I still have, uh, have the tanks, so I still have to pay a... Uh, so you like the under our tanks. Do you like the new road? Very good. Oh, it's good that ain't close to us. Yeah, it's on a new road like that. That's too far away from the place here, all the same. They were, they were the old road went through the old East West Road, and they put it miles away on the coast. The it's tourists well, are going to flock here in their hundreds and probably thousands. Uh, do you think the new road is going to help them? Oh, yes. They help them. But they won't be coming here. They won't be coming near the tourists, won't they? You're going to miss them all together? Yeah, well, we're going to have time to pull around the tourists now. The tourists just come here and just doing our time. Are you happy to see them go? Well, well no. not really, no. 
But as it is, we'll just get one odd car. Perhaps it might be weeks and weeks, and we'll see one car. Just a tourist comes in for a look, man. Perhaps their future will depend on the starving hordes of foxes, which have paid the ultimate price for threatening their sheep. At up to $12 a skin in the peak season, 63-year-old Cyril is spending more of these nights out on the plain as he prepares to counter the financial crisis caused by the service station shutdown. The Nullarbor's been hard on them, but giving up their desert home is something the Gurneys wouldn't contemplate. They are part of the plain now. They've adopted many of its natural inhabitants as family. The old road's landmarks are already disappearing. They're just not needed. Ivy tanks, once the world's loneliest petrol station, is victim number one. Yalit Emissions Aborigines had a notorious reputation as super artefact salesmen on the old road. Travellers reduced to moderate speeds along the uncertain surface found themselves under attack when they refused a purchase. 130 years after explorer Ayer's partner was killed by their predecessors, the Nullarbor's inhabitants were little changed. The superhighway has given the 1970s motorist the edge in this battle of tactics. But only a few weeks ago, a television crew found itself under attack from a rock-throwing group along the bitumen. Yalata's $50,000 a year business is threatened by a South Australian Highways Department roadside advertising ban along the air and the locals' rocky customer relations. Give it a go, they did, often with disastrous results. 1969 saw six people killed, 69 injured, and 90 vehicles put out of action. From a peak accident rate, which sidelined 106 vehicles in 1970, gradual road improvements helped reduce the toll. Cars and people aren't the only casualties of the highway. The price of apples along the air nosedived after a semi spilt its load recently near Mundrabilla. Damage was terminal and it joined dozens of other wrecks at the roadside graveyard. An eagle's eye view gives a breathtaking perspective of the new air and its proximity to the longest unbroken cliff line in the world. Records are commonplace out here. Less than 200 kilometres to the north, the longest, straightest stretch of railway bridges the barren plain. For most travellers, the highway hike is an armchair ride, a carpeted trip across a frontier, conquered by a handful of pioneers only a century ago. The cry, bitumen all the way, is spreading like a brush fire. To those who have known the area before the road was sealed, there will be an air of nostalgia. To those who have not previously travelled National Route 1, a new vista will be unfolded. The South Australian Highways Department, facing a dilemma, made its decision. Progress, meaning tourists, won out and a new route along the coast was chosen. Adelaide-based Roy Crawford, who started his business clearing a neighbour's yard 20 years ago, won his biggest contract, $1.5 million for the final scenic 90 kilometres to the border. A base camp bigger than all the towns in the air between Norseman in Western Australia and South Australia Sejuna was built. The spark which lit the fire for a final tar seal on South Australia's 400 kilometre horror strip was a belated federal budget allocation in 1972. Two and a half million dollars, enough to start the highway, hopelessly inadequate to finish it. Labor had the highway included for financial assistance in the National Roads Act two years later, and work on the South Australian side of the border accelerated. Men and machines poured in, the pipe dreams of Sir David Brand, Aubrey Melrose and a score of other visionaries were becoming a reality. Sixteen million dollars worth of filling, tar and bitumen poured across the dusty plain as the South Australians fired with a new enthusiasm raced towards the border. 
competition for places in these desert road gangs was keen. Wages varied between three and four hundred dollars a week. Roy Crawford interviewed scores of applicants before choosing his crew and all but a handful stuck to their task for the two-year contract. Greater driver Little John became one of the district's characters. His leaving brought a nostalgic farewell at the local border hotel. I've been in the city for the last six years. Very expensive. Well, I found it very expensive. You know, by the time you have a flat, uh, pay your tucker, electricity, got no time to save money. But out here, it's really good. Like, we get a good wage. Well, I get paid by two checks. One I send up home, which goes straight into my bank. Um, the other check I spend, uh, mainly on gambling and boozing on. Um, I've got money invested at the moment. Uh, I've got intentions of going overseas in a couple of years' time. And I found this is the only place really you could save money. Uh, the rest of the place, they got different ideas. One bloke wants to buy trucks. Um, the other bloke, they just spend the whole lot. I've done most of the final trim work on this road, and you look at it now, and you think, well, this is going to be here for at least a couple hundred years, and it's fantastic. You know, it's something I've done. I've you know, proved it's you know, really great. The policeman with the biggest beats in the West. That's Euclid Station Officer John Stubbs. He took up the posting ten months ago after transferring from the prosecuting branch in Perth. The open plains are worlds apart from the stuffy courtroom atmosphere he left behind. His job bears no resemblance to the conventional policeman's role. And when you're the only policeman for almost 500 kilometres, law enforcement takes its place alongside the dozens of other tasks you're called on to perform. A handful of would-be adventurers already owe their lives to the bushcraft of the man who risked his own to find them. Others, like the criminals he's captured on the run east or west, are not so grateful. The new road will bring more of them and more people in need of help. First off is an increase of traffic, which is going to cause more accidents. Um, although the South Australian government has gone to a lot of trouble as far as signs or beware signs of different objects on the, the highway, such as the wombat, kangaroo and the camel, people are under the misinterpretation, I think, of the size of the wombat. Um, as far as the accident side of it, uh, in other ways, there's caravans, an increase of caravans coming across from the eastern states and also going east from the west, and inexperienced drivers. Uh, all this sort of thing is going to contribute to uh, more accidents. <coughs> Things will be made a little bit easier for me. Uh, a constable from the uh, Road Traffic Authority pointed to this area. Um, with him out here, it'll make things a lot easier for him. It's still a lot of distance for two men to cover. Oh, it's a lot of distance. Buses and caravans by the sea. A 28 pounds two up win and a free ride on the Rattler train from Kalgoorlie brought Alex Stewart to the plane in 1932. Post depression work took him around its giant sprawling stations, herding, shearing, trapping dingoes, foxes, and eagle hawks. These days he runs healthy cattle and sheep on three quarters of a million acres. Little change from the days when John Forrest made his fruitless search for grazing country in the 1870s. His search for fresh water and his success in the area given away by air is almost legendary. Son Allen was contract supervisor on the final section of the new highway. Well, I mount his own bus, come and free, don't owe anything. I haven't got much, but what I have is mine. The main thing, and it? it's... It's pretty rough out here. Oh, I don't know. I get used to that. 
no people. No, you don't need people all the time. What, would you like to have a bit more comfort out here? Oh, I'm used to what I got, I couldn't care less. Water's very important to you. That's the main thing. Has it been a problem? All the time, yes. How long have you been looking for water here? Oh, about 20 years. The air come along here and couldn't find any water. But I beat him, I got three lots of water here. Alan, the new road's been a source of income for you. It's been wonderful, you know, it's, it's been a wonderful experience to build a new highway which people can travel over and say, well, look, thank you. It's been good, mate. You've done a good job. Road and rail fight a fierce battle for transport dollars on the Nullarbor run. Up till now, the silken surface rail has scored over its semi-primitive competitor. But a new breed of super semis and the blacktop highway across South Australia are swinging the pendulum back the other way. Fourteen new trucks made the run the day the new road opened. Stark evidence of a road haulage explosion. But one which will probably force old timers off the run. Laurie Clark made his first Nullarbor crossing 24 years ago. The best thing I like about the, the trip was um, when you pulled up to where the grid, grids are now, there used to be gates, uh, and the blokes would be there at the gate, and they'd say, uh, heard you coming, I've uh, got a bottle open. So then out would come the, all the cooking gear, and you'd... Uh, cook up a feed and probably next morning it's all decided that we're, by that time you've got 10 or 15 trucks there. Uh, it might take a couple of days off, you know. Were you frightened when you made that first trip? Well, it was sort of an airy sort of feeling, you know, because when you leave you're on your own, but as you get along the track, uh, they build up, you know, and you get a, well, like they call now, convoys nowadays. Uh, but everyone was having trouble. Tires and there we go. Uh, but we enjoyed it in those days. The new road should make it a lot easier. What does it really mean to you? Well, it means the faster trucks will get through a lot. They'll be happy because they've got good roads. But the brakes like myself, um, we like to take it quiet. Will you continue to use the new road? Uh, well, the cost of fuel nowadays and the price of tires, uh, I'm thinking about going on the rail. Road giants like these costing up to $85,000 and capable of making the Sydney Perth run in 54 hours are taking over the run. Drivers often charged with pep pills motor through the nights to meet the deadlines of demanding contractors. The old gravel surface is no longer an excuse for late arrivals. Carrying massive quantities of fuel, able to keep up with most cars, and sporting motel-type sleeping units for reserved drivers, they provide an almost non-stop service. The biggest and most expensive of them all, this road heavyweight has air-conditioned comfort for its driver, includes an 8-track stereo unit with television about to be installed. The old timers call them bitumen cowboys, the new breed. Driver John Catchlove has lived in both worlds. A few years ago, it was, it was a, a lot different. Uh, the pace wasn't as uh, as brisk, and you had more time to spend with your mates along the road. And we used to light a fire often and have an all-night party there. And uh, but now, now that it's, it's a bitumen high, well, it's, it's more more business-like, and uh, of course, competition's got uh, much tougher. And we've. Uh, got to work hard and go hard to, uh, to get there. Are you generally happy to see the new road put through? Oh, very happy, yeah. yeah. It uh, should have been, been done years ago. This is, this is one thing that, that me and the mates can understand, you know, that uh, South Australia didn't uh, seal their side of it when Western Australia did theirs, because uh, uh, it saves a lot of trouble. Uh, we, can, we can get across much quicker. And, uh, let's face it, if, if we can get the, the, the freight from east to west, uh, more faster and economically. Obviously, the people in, in Perth and those places are better. Life's pretty sweet. Have you got any problems uh, on the roads these days? Uh, oh yes, we we've got a, a lot of problems, mainly with the uh, the law, you know, in the, the the different states as far as uh, 
uh, axle capacities and the amount of freight that we're allowed to carry. Uh, roads have, have changed, for instance, th this one that, that, we're, that, we're, that we're, we're talking about now. But uh, as far as payloads and that goes, that hasn't changed at all. We're still restricted. See, if I can say, with a, a big expensive truck like this, which can carry any weight, really, uh, I can't put any more on it than, than I could say, uh, really, well, five or five or, or, or six years ago. Are some of the guys bending the law? Some of them do, yeah. I wouldn't like to mention any names, but uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, some of them bend the law. But it's it's a case of of have to. See, they've got big big truck payments to to meet. Uh, freight rates haven't risen that much. Well, actually, I've been told by the old timers since since the war, and of course, uh, running costs have. But uh, yeah, some of the blokes have got it. At, to make their truck payments. They've got families at, at, at home to support, and uh, truckies work as hard as, as anybody in this country, and uh, uh, as far as these, as the, the law allows, you know, with things like log books, and, uh, which are ridiculous anyway, because let's face it, all truckies bodgy their, their, uh, their log book, and I think uh, as soon as the different authorities realise this and abolish it, we'll be, we'll be far better off. Would you change your life or anything? No, I wouldn't. Rocketing world happenings like Muhammad Ali's heavyweight title fights across to Perth in a fraction of a second bridged the Nullarbor in 1970. A $10 million network of towers gave the Cinderella State unlimited license to the world. 25 years ago, only a handful of trunk calls could be made out of Western Australia at one time. A system little changed from the days when the first West and South Australian telegraphists established repeater links in the 1870s. Time is gradually levelling the old line. Tourists hoping to catch glimpses of this piece of Australiana will have to hurry. Eucla owes its existence to the original repeater station, but it's hard to imagine the bustling four-street town on the coast almost a century ago. Today's settlement, catering almost exclusively for the tourist trade, is perched atop cliffs over the Roe Plain at the head of the Eucla Pass. Old Eucla has fallen to the area's massive shifting sand hills. The past is buried. Crumbling walls and a couple of chimney stacks are all that remain. The two-state telegraph operation at Eucla was responsible for some legendary stories. The office was petitioned because South and Western Australia used different systems. The telegraphists may as well have been a continent apart as they handed messages through hatches across the border for deciphering before they were sent on to each capital city. Federation and the introduction of uniform Morse code saw the petition removed. The two staffs took up positions across a central table. From Eucla, the line followed a coastal course for several kilometres, exposed to the uncertain weather of the Great Southern Ocean. Salt spray caked on the wires and sometimes cut WA off from the rest of the world for 48 hours. There were plagues at Eucla. Three hordes of rabbits on a westerly push stripped what little vegetation there was and made way for today's giant sand dunes. Postings to Eucla lasted up to three years. Life on the shores of the Great Australian Bight was harsh. From the time explorer John Forrest's supply boat at Dewar anchored there in 1870 until the highway was built, the exposed bay and jetty have seen a steady stream of visiting supply and fishing boats. Eucla is still a base for area fishermen, but the jetty is disused, surrendering to the relentless sea. News teams from around the world focused their headline hungry eyes on Eucla in January 1972, after a cryptic telex message flashed across the globe. Locals reckoned they'd seen a kangaroo-clad blonde in the scrub. Parents of a dozen missing girls thought she was theirs. Border village proprietor Nick Butner recalls it. 
she was definitely seen by several people on the motel. I checked up uh, all the motel staff, all the shapely girls we had on the motel staff, and there was definitely none of them, so the identity of the person is still a mystery. There was a uh, tourist bus that came through in the first week in January 1972, and the people on the bus came through about half past two in the morning. They definitely claimed they saw her. The bus driver stopped the bus, they piled out, shone their torches around, made a few whistles and a few cooies, and then they finally put out a hamper uh, with food, cool drinks and uh, confectionery and so on. And uh, that hamper was taken away, but was it vulnerable then? I don't know. More than 62,000 vehicles, a record, made the crossing over the South Australian horror stretch in the past 12 months. <music> 1966's 40 a day average is a joke now, and with the damage risk almost eliminated, the traffic snowball is gathering momentum. Along the air, investors are reckoning on a massive 300% increase within 18 months, an explosion unprecedented in the Australian tourist industry. The new air, geographically one of the longest, is finding an international place among the great bitumen links of the world.